Well, good evening. Thank you, Genevieve, for that introduction. Uh, and thank you all at the Oxford Union for this privilege. Finally, I've been invited to speak somewhere Barack Obama hasn't. Uh, and I told him that. Um, and he said, yeah, but I stayed with the Queen. So he's competitive. Um, but there is something invigorating about you know, being with students. Uh, I spent some time earlier with the Oxford Democrats abroad at the King's Arms. Um, and now a lot of the time I, it was good. And uh, now a lot of the time I teach a course on speech writing at my own alma mater, Northwestern University. Um, I happen to think we have one of the most beautiful campuses in America. Uh, but Oxford is something else. This is like Hogwarts, just walking around. Uh, I will say though that I studied at Northwestern alongside Meghan Markle. Uh, so we proudly claim the Duchess of Sussex, and you should not listen to our president, she is lovely. <laughs> but each year now I train a new generation of speechwriters. And you know, I, I also try to share some of what I've learned in my 16 years of politics, and try to convince them that for all of its shortcomings and frustrations, it is a path worth pursuing. And before I take your questions, that's really what I want to talk about this evening. Um, I mean, I could talk about the twin omni shambles of American and British politics, the president is here after all, the baby Trump blimp gave it away. Still, I, but I don't want to spend, I was just talking with Genevieve about this, I don't want to spend you know, my time with you tonight making another case for why you know, Trump and his gang of uniquely amoral, bigoted, cruel, and corrupt grifters aren't fit for the jobs they hold. And you know, I don't want to talk about the dangerous and incoherent folly of his foreign policy. John Bolton was already here on Saturday and did that. <laughs> And one of, the, one of the rules of speech writing is to give a speech that only you can give. You know, the world has enough pundits. What it needs more of is you, active and engaged young leaders who dive in, you know, take over from the older people and make a difference. And I know that's not something I have to tell a group of Oxford students who came out on a Monday night, but I do want to share a little bit of what I've learned in my own experience about things like idealism and impatience, and about the utter thrill and the frustrating fragility of progress. Now, if you're anything like I was at your age, you, you're thinking about diving in, but you're not quite sure how. Um, after college, I just kind of moved to Washington because I had no idea what to do. And I had no connections there uh, beyond a buddy who was a school teacher, um, so he was no help, but he let me crash with him while I was trying to figure out what to do with my life. And you know, I figured I had a degree in political science, I'd seen every episode of The West Wing, let's do this. <laughs> well, uh, not quite. After a dozen failed interviews and dozens of unanswered resumes, uh, I realized that my degree in politics didn't impress anybody with decades in politics. You know, when an interviewer asks you, what can you do for us? Uh, they don't want to hear your, about your thesis on the Central American political economy. And that's one reason I teach now, to equip my students with the kind of marketable skills that I didn't have at their age. So I finally landed an unpaid internship in the United States Senate, where I was relegated to a windowless mailroom uh, making copies, walking the senator's dogs. But I was also reading and routing hundreds of letters a day from perfect strangers who were asking for help, who were you know, sharing their private hopes and heartbreaks, just, just hoping that somebody on the other end was listening and willing to do something about it. And that changed me. I learned that politics you know, isn't like the West Wing at all, and thank God I learned that lesson early. It's not about sexy walk and talks or quoting Aristotle to try to win people over to your side. The mailroom, the bottom, was the best possible place I could have started. And those were lessons that I've kept with me to this day. So over the next few years, I worked hard and climbed the ranks. And I even got to go to the Democratic National Convention in 2004 when a young state senator from Illinois, a skinny kid with a funny name, introduced himself to the world. And I was lucky enough to be on the floor for that. And it blew my mind because here was somebody who saw politics the way that I wanted to, even if I didn't fully know that I wanted to yet, as this imperfect but noble endeavor where together we can do great things that we can't do alone. As a way to collectively move the ball forward and change people's lives for the better. And you know, I must have talked about that speech a lot because that's when I got my shot. My, my boss poked his head around the corner one day and was like, can you write a speech? And I'd never thought about being a speechwriter, but I lied and said yes and stayed up all night long, kind of panicking my way through it. And you know, that one led to a few more, and eventually um, a colleague connected me with John Favreau, who was Senator Obama's chief speechwriter at the time, now a successful podcast host. And we hit it off, and I became an intern all over again, this time in Chicago, my hometown, this time on an upstart presidential campaign. And as our poll numbers rose and our crowds grew, so did my opportunities to write. And we won and went to the White House, and I moved in to an office in the West Wing with John. 
And I never stopped working my tail off so that when he left at the beginning of the second term and President Obama had to choose a new chief speechwriter, I was the only choice to take his place. So I made that quick. In less than 10 years, I went from mailroom intern to chief speechwriter in the White House. Uh, and it was a wild ride filled with a lot of, lot of lucky breaks and, and certainly some privilege, even if I'm making it sound easier than it actually was. And it was two terms filled with hardship and friendship, you know, crushing stress and soaring achievement. I met world leaders and I met my wife. Uh, one of her many tasks at the White House was to fact check my speeches. So I like to say she literally got paid for telling me I was wrong. <laughs> um, which she gladly does today for free. <coughs> and at the end of 2016, President Obama asked me if I'd stick with him in what we call the afterlife. And I said yes, and I, and I still work for him today. Um, but I've been fortunate, though, to work for somebody who views speech writing as a craft, as a way to organize his thoughts into a coherent argument, imagine that, and share them with the world. <laughs> and, you know, he was anonymous when he walked into that Boston Hall in 2004, and 18 minutes later, he was a political rock star. So he knows the power of what a good speech can do. Um, to this day, by the way, he reminds me that he wrote that Boston speech by himself, without any speech writers, uh, like all the time. <laughs> But every time we sit down to game out a new speech, he begins with one question. What story are we trying to tell? And that's something important to certainly speech writing, but also politics. You know, how do you make sense of the moment we're in? How do you get people to follow you? It's by giving them a vision worth following. And, you know, my team and I wrote 3,577 speeches and statements in the White House, uh, most of which will never be remembered. You know, they're not all winners. Some are pretty boring. More often than not, you're either responding to something or trying to push a policy or drive a news cycle, but sometimes you actually get to craft a pretty great story to confront the world as it is and paint a picture of the world as it should be. And that's the opportunity we had in, in one speech I want to talk about. It was a 2015 speech in Selma, Alabama. Um, and I, wanted, I chose this speech because it speaks to so much of what's driving our political battles today. Uh, I think here too. Now, for those of you who might not know Selma's place in American history, it was a place where in 1965, a group of mostly black Americans set out to march to the state capital of Montgomery to demand the right to vote. And they barely made it across the town bridge before their nonviolent protest was met with violent resistance. They were beaten, they had attack dogs set on them, they were fire hosed. And the images of that, of, of young people bleeding and crying, um, you know, kind of set the country on fire. And, and it pushed President Johnson to call for a Voting Rights Act, followed a year later by the Civil Rights Act. And so the idea that just 50 years after that march, a black president would come back to commemorate what they did uh, was extraordinary enough. And we could have gone with a simple speech commemorating that anniversary and people would have understood the symbolism. But we always looked to say something more, to find an opportunity to make a bigger argument. And back then we were at a point in the presidency where you know, the economy had largely stabilized and that's what had been casting a cloud over our politics for so many years. And people were feeling better than they had in years. Um, and with that cloud receding, you know, perennial questions of justice and equality were coming to the fore in new ways. And in many ways, that, that original struggle at Selma was one that was still playing out in our politics. Um, like I said, it's what's playing out in yours. And the, the questions around it are, are we, you know, a static country racked by fear and blame and, you know, nationalist longing for some simpler past that never really existed? Or are we, you know, a country that's diverse and dynamic, you know, that views constant change as our hallmark, as, as, as people bound not by bloodline, but by common ideals and common values. And so we wanted to make sense of this moment, and I sat down to write, and, and sometimes inspiration comes from the unlikeliest places. Uh, you know, I happened to turn on Fox News, and the week before the speech, Rudy Giuliani, America's worst television lawyer, <laughs> went on Fox and said this, I know this is a terrible thing to say. Now, by the way, if you preface a thought that way, <laughs> you don't have to finish it. You can stop or pivot to something else. But he continued, he said, I do not believe that the president loves America. He wasn't brought up the way you were brought up and I was brought up through love of this country. Now, everybody knows what he meant by that. You know, we'd already won re-election, whatever, but it was the same racist dog whistle that Fox News had made it stock and trade, kind of this constant low-level buzzing designed to delegitimize the first African-American president. So I was pissed about it because I have a thin skin about that stuff, but the president, true to form, was not that ruffled by it. 
he didn't really care what Rudy Giuliani had to say. And he finds that definition of patriotism. You know, America, love it or leave it. My flag pen is bigger than yours. To be lazy and small. He did, however, think that it was an idea worth taking on. You know, who gets to decide what it means to be an American, right? Who gets to decide who belongs and who doesn't? Who gets to decide what patriotism is all about? I mean, definitely not Rudy Giuliani, but what about those marchers in Selma, right? What about the people who risked their lives for the equal treatment they were promised? People who believe that, patri that protest is patriotic, a way to push you know, their countries to live up to their lofty ideals. And so we came up with a thesis of that speech. It was not a clash of armies, but a clash of wills, a contest to determine the true meaning of America. And what could be more American than what happened in this place? What could more profoundly vindicate the idea of America than plain and humble people, the unsung, the downtrodden, the dreamers not of high station, not born to wealth or privilege, not of one religious tradition, but many, coming together to shape their country's course? What greater expression of faith in the American experiment than this? What greater form of patriotism is there than the belief that America is not yet finished, that we are strong enough to be self-critical, that each successive generation can look upon our imperfections and decide that it was within our power to remake this nation to more closely align with our highest ideals. And we took the opportunity in that speech too to kind of retell America's history in a truer way, to pull a Walt Whitman and weave in some characters from our story that don't always get the credit they deserve. So, you know, alongside the founding fathers, also all the women who shook the system until it reflected truth. You know, not just cowboys and pioneers pushed west, but the slaves who built the southern economy. Not just soldiers who fought against tyranny, but protesters whose blood ran just as red in the fight for equality. And the feeling of all those struggles swirling together inspired me to add a riff that I've been playing with for some time and just didn't know where to deploy it. And that when America is not the project of any one person, the single most powerful word in our democracy is the word we. We the people. We shall overcome. Yes, we can. That word is owned by no one. It belongs to everyone. What a glorious task we are given to continually try to improve this great nation of ours. So if there's just one speech out of those 3,577 I could force you to watch, that would be it. It was the best, most joyous distillation of the way that he sees what America is, and more importantly, can be. It was patriotism for grown-ups. And it was the idea that, that through the hard work of self-government, you know, generations of people, usually young people, often without power or title, often a great risk to themselves, looked upon our flaws and worked to widen the circle of our founding ideals until they applied to all of us and not just some of us. And again, you know, that's how I have always wanted to see politics, as this collective endeavor. The balance between the realism to see the world as it is and the idealism to fight for the world as it should be anyway. And then just three months later, I s got my evidence that that theory could be true. It was, it was the 10 most hopeful days I ever saw in politics. And they began in the darkest way imaginable, a mass shooting at an African American church in Charleston, South Carolina. And the assassin had a Confederate flag on his backpack, which is you know, the symbol of the racist South. And it was an act designed to open reopen old wounds and spark all kinds of recrimination. But it didn't unfold that way. In the next few days, the families of the victims, one by one on national television, forgave the killer in court. And that act of grace and generosity, I think created the space for the public recognition of the pain that the Confederate flag stirs in so many citizens and paved the way for an actual sort of, you know, mature introspection and self-examination that we don't often see in public life to the point where lawmakers actually voted to bring down the Confederate flag that still flew over the South Carolina State Capitol. Now, meanwhile, at the same time, it was a week where our Supreme Court can rule on any case at any time with no heads up. And two of them are ones that we've been watching closely. One was conservatives had made another attempt to unravel our health reform and you know, deny insurance to millions. And the second one was LGBT citizens had finally brought the question of whether or not the Constitution guaranteed he had a right to marriage equality. So while I'm working on the president's eulogy for Charleston, my team and I were also busy drafting all sorts of other backup statements in case he had to speak quickly. And Thursday morning, boom, 10 a.m. sharp, Obamacare was upheld as constitutional for the second time. 
And alongside our relief, I thought back to all those letters I'd read over all the years from all the people who were desperate for some sort of health insurance. And I thought about them that morning, not the, not the pundits on TV talking about what this meant politically, but everyone who could breathe a sigh of relief that they or their kid might be covered for another year. 24 hours later, Friday morning, boom, marriage equality finally became a reality in America. And we're still working on the eulogy, but I can't help look at the television and see you know, smiling people on the steps of the Supreme Court, you know, kissing their loved ones, someone they can finally get married to now, wondering how anybody could possibly be upset at a sight of unbridled joy like that. And again, thinking about all those letters that I read over all the years about the injustice of not being able to marry the person you love or visit them in the hospital or, you know, even share basic benefits under tax law. So an hour later, uh, after Obama spoke again, we boarded Marine One to fly to Air Force One, which would ferry us down to Charleston for the eulogy. And I was still working in his changes for the remarks that afternoon. Uh, he'd been inspired by those families, and he, and he added the lyrics to Amazing Grace overnight. And while we were on the helicopter, just before he stepped off, he, he turned and looked down, and he said, you know, if it feels right, I might sing it. And I hadn't slept in like three days, so I was exhausted, and I was just like, you do you, man, whatever. <laughs> Whatever. Do you want me to like write it in there or something? <laughs> um, and he led the country in a chorus of amazing grace. And then that night as the sun went down, we landed at the White House that was lit up in all the colors of the rainbow. And we were exhausted over the course of those 10 days, but uh, exhilarated too. I mean, there were 10 days that I think about all the time. You know, four of our original sins all seem to be coming due at once, racism, violence, bigotry, inequality, and, you know, any payment could have torn at the fabric of America at any moment, but it didn't, not that week. We didn't see the type of thing we saw in Charlottesville a couple years ago. It really felt like we were breaking free from the past into something new and maybe a little scary. And it was just four years ago this month. And I know that you know, America looks like a different country now in a lot of ways. You know, one that eschews dis diplomacy and, and embraces dictators and punishes the marginalized and protects the powerful and ignores climate change and lets immigrant kids die in custody. You know, the winds shifted quickly and I do wonder if part of that is the backlash to progress like that. And, and we've seen that kind of backlash all throughout our history. You know, for every two steps forward, you can take a step back doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. And maybe the clash of wills, you know, tip the other way. But what the important thing is about those 10 days is that none of that progress happened because of one week or one presidency or even one generation. It happened because young people over the course of decades chose to protect not only their rights but the rights of others, to care not only about their own children but each other's children. It's because they demanded something more from their country and they kept fighting and they kept marching until that arc of history bent. You know, we didn't plan those 10 days. We didn't design them at all. But that's part of what made it so rewarding. It felt like what Obama had always promised us as staff, that we could be part of something bigger than ourselves, to be part of a continuum of history. That's, that's what gives you some purpose in what you're doing. And that's what he always told us, that our work would never be perfect, and it didn't have to be. You know, all we could do was our best to take up the work of others before us, advance it as far as we can, and then hand the baton off to a new generation. And so what I want you to know is, yes, politics is messy and frustrating and disappointing. You know, I have r I've raised a glass on the Truman balcony with, you know, colleagues once we won health insurance for 20 million Americans. And I've cried with parents in the Rose Garden whose kids were murdered in their classroom, and then they watched their members of Congress do nothing about it. But it was that exhausting, fulfilling work over those 2,922 days that gave my career meaning. It vindicated that belief I had so many years earlier in what politics could be. And that doesn't mean that your ideas are always gonna win. Sometimes that boulder you've been pushing uphill slips, and you gotta take a breath and go back down and get it. Sometimes you end up with a giant baby in a diaper floating over Piccadilly. <laughs> <laughs> a speech doesn't change the world, you know? 
stories aren't enough, politics remains that clash of wills, and progress is not inevitable. It is fragile. And that very fragility, its impermanence, requires constant vigilance on all our parts. Not just in the days where it feels good, not just in the presidential election years or big elections, but all the days in between. And whenever I feel you know, the tugging temptation of cynicism, and I'm vulnerable to it just like anybody else, I do reach for those 10 days as my proof point of what's possible, that this whole messy endeavor of democracy can work. They were on my mind as I added these words to the end of President Obama's farewell address. Ultimately, that's what our democracy demands. It needs you. Not just when there's an election, not just when your own narrow interest is at stake, but over the full span of a lifetime. If you're tired of arguing with strangers on the internet, try to talk with one in real life. If something needs fixing, lace up your shoes and do some organizing. If you're disappointed by your elected officials, and get some signatures on a clipboard and run for office yourself, show up. Dive in. Persevere. Sometimes you'll win, sometimes you'll lose. Presuming that reservoir and goodness in others can be a risk. And there are times when the process will disappoint you. But for those of us who've been fortunate enough to see this process up close, to have been a part of this work, let me tell you, it can energize and inspire. And more often than not, your faith in America and in Americans, and you can substitute Britons in there too, will be confirmed. I still believe that, despite everything, because while the levers of power may have changed, you know, Americans are still generous and optimistic. I have read too many of those letters, and I still read them to believe otherwise. Americans are still hopeful and compassionate and brave and forward-looking, especially your young counterparts, most of all. So many of your concerns and aspirations are the same ones that my students share, that young Americans share. They are just as fed up and as fired up as you are. So the future is still on your side, as long as there are enough of you who, you know, for all of our frustrations and imperfections, and, and despite lack of wealth or power or title, still choose to press forward with determination and perseverance. Who choose to engage in that clash of wills until that arc of history finally bends for good. So with that, good luck on finals. <laughs> Thank you all very much, and I'm eager to answer any questions. Cody, thank you so much for being here today and for giving that brilliant speech. Thank you for having me. Um, I have to ask, how does it compare writing a speech for yourself with writing a speech for President Obama? And is it sometimes difficult to write your own speech and find your own voice when you're so used to stepping into his shoes and, and writing something for him? Yes, it's, it, it's hard to find my own voice because I also agree with, because well, I've been writing for him for 12 years, mm. uh, but I also agree with so much of what I wrote for him, with him, um, that it was tough. It is. It's easier to write a speech now because I don't have to give it to him. That was always the worst part, you know, <laughs> knowing that he's going to read a draft. Like, we, we would kill ourselves to get that first draft perfect, not the final one. Um, it's harder because it's me, right? So now everyone's watching me while I do it. Uh, and it, it, they're your words that you have to stand up to. You know, I, if, if he ended up giving a bad speech, you know, the New York Times isn't writing a story saying the speechwriters really blew it on that one. Um, <laughs> So there was a little safety involved because he would, he would usually take whatever drafts we prepared for him and take them to a place we couldn't always reach. And um, could you walk us through the process of actually writing a winning political speech? How does it work? You mentioned that you give him a draft. Is that always how it happened? Did you give him a first draft? And what would he do? Would he hand you back a very heavy, heavily edited version? Or would there not be much sort of back and forth between you and him? He is a writer. Um, you know, like it, it, was, it was true what I said, he reminds me all the time he wrote the Boston speech by himself. Um, he was reluctant to hire John in the first place, he was reluctant to have any speechwriters. So he views speechwriting as, like I said, as a way to, you know, lay out a thoughtful argument and present it to the world and he spends a lot of time on it and he trusts us to take it and, and you know, write down what he wants to say and thinks and, you know, ideally, we would give, ideally with any draft, we would give him whatever he would say if he had the time, you know, to, to write it. Um, but he would always tell us, just give me something I can work with. So 
we would always give them draft of every speech, uh, and they would always come back marked up some more than others. Sometimes the yellow legal pad would come out uh, in which he'd rewrite entire sections of it. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that Charleston eulogy, for example, I, you know, I gave it to him and uh, went home and I got an email from him two hours later and he had crossed out the last two pages and rewrote them by hand, um, which was tremendously annoying. Uh, imagine, yeah. <laughs> but also pretty wonderful. And we live in a society now where many of the speeches that you might spend hours or even days writing are picked up and we place huge value on sort of sound bites. And we can see, I mean, the president now um, really likes sort of foreign policy by tweet. And that was something we talked about on Saturday. Do you think about that when you're writing a speech? And do you worry that certain bits will be picked out and used to misrepresent what you were trying to get at? And does that sort of come into the methodology when you're writing or do you not think about it? Because if you did, it would sort of take over the whole process and you couldn't say anything meaningful. Yeah, you nailed it at the end. I mean, I, I wouldn't really think about it until towards the end of the drafting process. Because, you know, the president views any speeches as, as telling a story, not building a speech around sound bites. You know, you might have that one perfect line you've been waiting to deploy, but you can't build a speech around a perfect line. It'll fall apart like a house of cards. Um, so we would try to craft a narrative and you know, he just, he kind of disdains sound bites. He's never been a sound bite guy. I mean, he really trusts the audience to be able to absorb a longer, more thoughtful argument. Um, and he's taken plenty of criticism for that, but it's who he is. You know, that's why a lot of our big speeches were an hour long. Um, not just because we, we couldn't edit ourselves, but because he wanted to make you know, deep arguments and tell the story of how we got here and add historical context and lay out a roadmap for where to go. Um, so he, he, he disdained sound bites. We had, we had different advisors over the course of the years who would approach speeches differently too. We had, you know, David Axelrod was our senior advisor the first two years and he was a writer too. He's a former uh, newspaper reporter. So he would dive in and make a lot of edits everywhere. Uh, later on we had David Pluff and then Dan Pfeiffer and they went for the sound bite. Not, not kind of the lasting one that gets etched into something, but they, they just wanted something that the media would pick up the next day and run with as a headline. Mm -hmm. And they were really good at that. We'd often get a speech back that just had one edition from Dan or David. And more often than not, that was the one thing the newspapers ran with the next day. They were really good at picking that out. And a big feature of President Obama's speeches was comedy, and that was especially prevalent in that farewell speech which you wrote. Does that, how important do you think that is within speeches generally? And do you think it's something that you should learn if you're a politician because it does put an audience at ease? Yes. Or do you think if you're not funny, then you shouldn't try and be funny? You should absolutely try to learn it as a politician because it does put the audience at ease. It's also a great way to, you know, dispense with criticism, mm -hmm. right? Like we, you know, he made fun of the whole birther movement more often than he had stood up and explained, no, I actually am an American. Mm -hmm. You know, instead he'd poke fun at the whole thing. Um, he did it in the, you know, he, he spoke at uh, Westminster to the mother of parliaments and said, uh, no, I'm sorry, that was a different speech. Uh, Parliament was one where he, he walked in and said, I've heard the, the last three speakers here were Nelson Mandela, the Pope, and the Queen. It's a bad joke. Yeah, so which, is either, which is either start to a really funny joke or something else. Um, <laughs> but no, he gave a speech where he was talking about how politics has never been particularly civil and that Thomas, Jefferson, uh, Thomas Jefferson's opponents used to portray him as a Muslim. Uh, he said, so I'm in good company. Um, but humor is a good way to diffuse the situation. It's also a good way to make your opponents look small. Mm. And obviously humor is a big part of sort of personality politics. Yeah. And in recent years, you could argue that we've seen a move from issue-based politics to personality-based politics. Do you think that's a bad thing? Uh, and if not, why? That's a good question. Um, I think it's mixed. I mean, it, certainly, you know, if you're looking at our, our field of Democratic candidates right now, um, when you have that many People aren't quite voting on policy specifics yet. They might demand particular ones, but with that many people trying to make a name for themselves, um, personality base becomes a way to go. You know, it's more prevalent in all campaigns because you're, you're trying to get somebody to vote for you. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like Mario Cuomo once said, you campaign in poetry and govern in prose. Um, but I, you know, I, I don't think you need to lay out detailed policies right now at a point, at this point in the presidential cycle. You know, it really is getting people to trust you and want to listen to you more, you know, to become a donor, to become a supporter, to ultimately become a voter. And how do you strike that balance in a speech of putting across maybe an important new policy, but not boring everyone to death when you're doing it? We, we, we always had very significant battles with our policy people. Um, you know, we're the communicators and they're the experts and there's a 
a lot of headbutting in between because while you know you can have an amazing policy, mm -hmm. what you really need to do is get people to remember it and take it home and tell other people about it. Um, so they'd always say, "You guys are just dumbing it down. This is terrible." And we'd say, "I'm not going to write what you wrote. That's not even English." Um, <laughs> so you try to find something in between. I mean, I've often said that if you're, you know, write a speech like you're talking to your best friend at a bar. You know, if, if somebody asks you, you know, what did you do today? You're not going to say, well, I, I leveraged an innovative microfinancing mechanism to blah, 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 blah. You're going to say, like, I don't know, I, I helped more kids uh, get into pre-kindergarten. That's easier to understand. And just to finish before we move to audience questions, what advice would you give to young aspiring speechwriters or to people more generally that want to get involved in politics and the political sphere? Uh, my advice to anyone who wants to get involved is just get involved and do it. And you end up, you know, it's like... You guys probably don't know what Plinko is, but it's when you drop this chip into a bunch of different things and try to get them the number. You will get sorted out into a place that fits you. You know, if you, f President Obama always says, focus less on what you want to be and more on what you want to do. You know, if you just say from right now, I want to be president, then you are going to spend the next 20 years, or prime minister, you're going to spend the next 20 years, you know, being a robot that doesn't necessarily say or do anything interesting. But if if your goal is to you know, get the world to zero emissions or to alleviate global poverty or to uh, fix the NHS, you know, focus on that like a laser. People will notice. You'll learn a lot along the way. You'll meet a lot of interesting people along the way. And ultimately, you might just get to where you wanted to be in the first place. And even if you don't, you will have accomplished a lot of good along the way rather than just letting your ambitions run wild. Um, for a speechwriter, start writing right now like crazy. You know, there's this terrible catch-22 for, for young speechwriters. They say, well, I, you know, I got an interview for a speechwriting job, but they wanted to see speeches I'd written before, and I don't have any. But how am I going to have any if nobody's going to hire me as a speechwriter? Uh, and I tell them, well, take my class, and you will have 18 speeches in your portfolio by the time you leave. But just start writing. You know, there are, you know, the, 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 the deans here probably give speeches. Local business people probably give speeches. Um, and nobody's really good at it. You know, there, there's a real lack of good speechwriting talent in the world. So take a shot and you'll create your portfolio right there. Just on that, you touched on end goals. Do you have uh, any sort of career aspirations beyond speechwriting? Anything mm. in terms of elected office perhaps or not really? My wife won't allow elected office. <laughs> uh, I've thought about it. Mm. Um, but no, I, you know, I, teaching has been more rewarding than I thought it would be. Uh, I mean, I knew it would be, but it's been it's far surpassed that. So I, I've signed up to teach at Northwestern for several more years. Um, and ultimately, I wouldn't mind doing that forever, really, and writing on the side. I mean, I, I don't know if I'm done with politics. I'm taking some time away. I'm still working with the president, um, President Obama. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even mean that as a joke. I was just being clear. Um, but, you know, if, if the right person comes along, I, I could be tempted to get back in and help. Okay. I think we'll move to audience questions. If you have a question for Cody, just raise your hand and the mic will come to you. Can we go to the hand in the second row in the blue checkered shirt? Um, thank you, Cody. Um, so you talked about young Democrats taking action. As the best and brightest tend to crowd towards the biggest liberal cities, LA, mm. New York, DC, following in the example of a lot of Democratic leaders, how do you think that we can re-engage with the rest of the country, especially after seeing Hillary lose the Electoral College by just tens of thousands of votes? That's a really good question. Um, I, I, I think, you know, there's, it's kind of a chicken and the egg thing, right? Like young people tend to be more liberal and, and flock to cities too. Um, but I do spend a lot of time speaking at college campuses around the states, uh, including in bright red areas. Um, I did one in Texas this year and one in North Carolina this year. And, you know, young people are more interested in politics than you would think, um, especially in those areas. And they, they don't conform to, you know, kind of rigid rules of Democratic and, and Republican Party. Um, you know, you see, you, you see mo most young people, like, just don't think it's weird that someone would be, you know, uh, gay, lesbian, transgender, whatever. Most young people do think it's weird that we're not doing anything about climate change. Um, and there's a real, I mean, this, the great sorting of the, 
in politics now, and, and I've seen this happening here too, you know, is, is really between generations. Um, you know, older people skew Republican in 2018 in the States, and younger people, like the bottom fell out for the Republican Party. Um, I think the same happened here with, with labor and, and the conservatives. Uh, at the same time, though, voting rates for young people still need to get way, way up from where they were. I mean, in 2004, I mean, sorry, 2018, in 2014, the midterms in the states, only 19% of young people voted. Um, that ticked up to 30 last time, which was you know, almost a record, but it still means 70% aren't. And when 70% of old people are, that, those are the kind of policies we're gonna get stuck with. Um, so really, you know, the antidote really is young people voting like crazy, you know. And, you know, you saw what happened in our Congress last fall, right? Uh, you know, record numbers of women and minorities and like there are babies in the halls of Congress now, you know, whose moms are in Congress. Uh, a woman who was a bartender in the Bronx two years ago is now one of the most talked about politicians in America. Um, there are a bunch of individual amazing races where people that you would think had no business winning Congress a couple decades ago are now in Congress. Um, so that's a roundabout way of saying we can get voters everywhere. We can engage people everywhere. Um, there's no kind of one simple trick to it. The party really needs to get out onto college campuses no matter where they are and get people registered and convince them that voting matters and convince them that the one thing that drives me more crazy than anything else is when people say there's no difference between the parties. Oh my God, on literally every issue, <laughs> there's a difference between the parties. Um, there are no issues where the parties are in full agreement, really. I mean, we barely name post offices anymore. Um, so I, if you still believe that, I don't know what to tell you. But uh, the party needs to play for people everywhere. That's what we did in 2008, and it worked. You know, follow that. Can we go to the yep, hand there at the back in the brown cardigan? Thank you very much for this speech that you crafted for yourself. Um, you talked a lot about the concept of story and you said this is a great way to convey meaning. A point I agree with you, although you could just use, for example, rhetorics which don't convey any meaning, uh, don't make stories but still convey meaning. So maybe stories are also about something else, which is truth. And you've been very prone in your speech to talk in a very black and white way, a very American movie way, between current, current government and previous government. Between what, I'm sorry? The current government and yeah. the previous government. And in a way that some would say carries a lot of lies, or at least some disbelief in, I mean, just the way you, you've been portraying the state of affair. So not to say either that I think that the current president is a great guy and doesn't say a lot of lies or a lot of stories. I actually think he had lies upon lies in some kind of ideological soup. But from this point, my question I suppose would be, don't you think that by crafting big, beautiful stories, you also craft big, beautiful lies and that people tend to disbelief or be disenchanted when it comes to politics and or to just become more polar polarized in the way they vote. Sure, I mean you can. Dictators have crafted big beautiful lies for centuries. Uh, we didn't. You know, I mean it kind of depends on who's <laughs> speaking. Um, I mean, you know, the Washington Post has documented what, I think like 9,000 lies from the president now. I mean, it doesn't really matter anymore. Uh, but I mean, like, the answer is sure. It depends on who the speaker is. I have another question. Can we go to the hand, yeah, at the back with the glasses? What would be your recommendation for crafting speeches for audiences that have opposing viewpoints in a way that can, you know, get to that audience? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you should always, you know, pick some universal values that you're going to talk to the audience about. You know, things that are, you know, uh, universal truths that everyone's passionate about. Make sure, you know, don't ever buckle on your own convictions. Explain them. Uh, you shouldn't go into a hostile audience assuming that you're going to win over that entire audience. 
what you can win over is their respect, um, and that can go a long way. So, but, but also make, give them the sense that they're being heard, that you're at least making a good faith effort to understand their beliefs before you, you know, lay out your own uh, and use facts and evidence. That doesn't always work either. I mean, people are prone to, there's one study on how if, if you can run to climate change denier with all sorts of facts and evidence, they become even more of a climate change denier. Uh, and I have no idea how to combat, you know, that. But be yourself most, most of all. I mean, people are always, I, I always get asked questions about authenticity, right? Like how does a, what makes a politician authentic? And, you know, there's this, there's this great line in American politics that, uh, you know, everyone who runs for office wants you to believe they were born in a log cabin that they built with their own two hands, right? <laughs> to be authentic isn't just, you know, uh, being folksy uh, or, you know, we have to go through this whole rigmarole of, you know, every candidate has to go to Iowa and eat like fried corn on a stick and <laughs> do all these things. But, but true authenticity is just staying true to who you are and what you believe and you know, saying something to an audience that they may wildly disagree with. And you know, I think it's weird that that comes off as refreshing. You, know, you might walk out of there being like, boy, I didn't, I didn't agree with a single thing, but at least they didn't pander to me. Um, and it's weird that that's, that's what passes off as authentic these days. So uh, you know, if you do have a controversial opinion, you should air it, you know, and you should back it up with facts and evidence for your point and try to win people over to your side by saying, you know, maybe find something that you can completely agree on and say we're working towards this. Uh, I just have a whole different way of doing it than you do. Can we go to the hand in the front? Thank you very much for your speech and address. Um, so I just want to pick up on the idea of truth in politics in that there's a lot of sort of recent uh, criticism of Trump that I think is very valid that observes the fact that he flagrantly disregards truth and whatnot when he makes claims. But I think increasingly th there almost seems to be this perverse, um, converse relation where the, the less truth there is in his speech, the more attractive and appealing it is to mm. at least his base, as you know, to just then, if not the general uh, uninformed individual out there. And some say, like Arendt and whatnot, that there's an antagonism between truth and politics or that truth has no place in politics, not because truth is bad, but simply because politics is too dirty, a space for truth in that sense. So I guess my question is, on one hand, you have to uphold the mission of truth keeping. On the other hand, there seems to be a need to engage, to mobilize, to rally. And there's a fear that truth can be off-putting, can be too stark and too dangerous for people to understand or grasp fully. And that's why people like to listen to half-truths, non-truths and fake news. So where do you think the balance should be struck and what do you think is the path forward for? Progressive politicians want to recapture that sweet spot between telling the truth and mobilizing the troops as well. Thank you. I mean, I think the sweet spot should be the truth. Um, I, I, I see where you're going. It's, it's, <laughs> my wife is going to be so upset. She was, she was one of our fact checkers, right? And, and there are uh, a couple units in the States that, that fact check politicians. One is PolitiFact. Uh, What's the other one? It's not another one. But PolitiFact would rate things from, you know, true to mostly true, half true, uh, mostly false, pants on fire, right? And I'd always tell my wife, my wheelhouse was mostly true. And she'd be so angry about that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I always viewed mostly true as like, you know, what you're saying is true, but you don't have to, uh, you know, you, you, you say almost a million instead of, 997,346. Um, but I see what you're saying. You do want to mobilize people to a cause, right? You leave out context sometimes. The balance should be for the truth, right? Because once you're labeled a liar, you don't really come back from that. Um, now, does it affect Donald Trump? You could argue no, but you could also argue yes. You know, he, he didn't win the popular vote. He's the only president in history who has never been above 50% for one day in his presidency. Every single day of his presidency, a majority of Americans have viewed him as dishonest. You know, we, we tend to treat him as if he's got some magic dust that he's made it this far. But, uh, you know, of course, he's, he's still president for another two years, but he's eminently beatable because he hasn't shown any capacity to win new voters over to his side. Um, so don't play fast and loose with the truth. 
Just on that, do you think that he's unlikely to be re-elected? I think you have to approach him as the front runner, the favorite right now. Um, I think you're foolish if you don't. You know, you've got the advantage of incumbency. He's able to raise money from now until the election mm -hmm. and just spend it on whoever the Democratic opponent is, whereas, you know, 23 Democrats are splitting up that pie. Um, he's already, you know, opened the floodgates to more Russian help. Um, and, you know, the Republicans have built an advantage with dark money after Citizens United, gerrymandering. So he's got all the advantages. You know, they're, you know, I think it's, I can't remember what it is right now. I think like the Democrats have to turn out at least 2% more just to win. And over the next decade, that's gonna get worse unless we have a bunch of structural changes. So, you know, really the only option is for Democrats to come out and vote at unprecedented levels, you know, to leave no doubt. Because uh, I don't think he's gonna leave willingly if it's close. You know, I mean, we really need to kick his ass uh, and, and leave no doubt. Can we go to the hand in the pink jumper? Thank you. I wanted to ask you to what extent you believe speech writing can handle nuances. <laughs> Obviously, when you're confronted with climate change deniers, that is easy to handle in a speech. But if we agree climate change is real, we need to discuss how to handle it. If we agree people have a right to social security, but we are d discussing market, um, the merits of a market-based solution versus the merits of a state-based solution, how can speech writing handle that when you need the policy and the detail? I have an easy answer to that. Just read any Barack Obama speech. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, there's a reason a lot of them were an hour long is because they're full of nuance. Um, I mean, I, I think it's an important part of it. It's tough on the campaign trail. It's tough in debates, uh, you know, American style debates where you only get 30 seconds to answer a question, which is, I find preposterous. Um, but I think there's tons of room in speech writing for nuance. I mean, it, it, speech writing is not just handing somebody a piece of paper and saying, go read this. You know, it is making that thoughtful, detailed, nuanced case. I mean, the more important question is, is there room for nuance in politics? You know, it's, it's, it's so hard now to try to make a nuanced argument when someone will just shoot you down or shout you down or, you know, make a quick pithy sound bite. Um, but I think it's vital because the world is not black and white. The world is a million shades of gray. And people are different too. You know, we, we just, we're just, even me here, we're now we're prone into sorting people into different parties, but People are complicated and have all sorts of different beliefs. You know, you may be a raging conservative on one issue and but wildly liberal on the, on the left uh, on another. Um, so I think it's critical to speech writing. I mean, it's what really makes a good speech. It shows that you have the capacity to have different ideas in your head at the same time. You know, I, I prefer it when a politician shows some nuance. It shows that they're open to new ideas. It shows they've actually thought about what they're saying and that there might be different points of view as to how to get it done. We go to the hand, yeah, just in the middle there. Sorry. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, my question is whether there's been a time that your views or response towards a particular issue has differed from the president's, and if so, how do you balance your duty of care with your consciousness? I've been really lucky, uh, and that hasn't really happened. Um, like really lucky, I mean, he, he and I tend to agree on almost everything. There were a couple times in the first term um, where I wanted to go a lot harder on climate change and marriage equality, and uh, our strategists pushed back, you know, saying if you, wanna, if you wanna handle these things, we need to win re-election, and these are gonna hurt us in re-election. Now we were, you know, he was already the, the most accomplished president on climate change, at least in American history, in the first term. Um, but, you know, some of our strategists were like, let's just talk about it a little bit less. Uh, which I found offensive, but it's also, you know, the job. You do what the principals want. Um, now, fortunately, we haven't disagreed on any issue, right? Like, he wasn't a denier, and I was, you know, in favor of doing something about climate change. But, so those are really simple ones. Um, but if, if we disagreed on a fundamental issue, um, the boss wins. I mean, that's the job of being a speechwriter. You, you can quit and protest, but you have to write what the person ultimately wants. We argued a lot on the way to talk about certain things, um, and he always liked hearing you know, a passionate argument for it, and sometimes even went your way. Um, but if he doesn't, you know, at least you put up a fight. It's interesting here, I, I've gotten to know one of the speechwriters at number 10, um, and you know, he's written now for Brown, Blair, Cameron, and May. 
And the idea of that is it doesn't exist in American politics. You know, like <laughs> there would not be a Clinton, Bush, Obama, Trump speechwriter. <laughs> um, we're just different that way. But, uh, you know, that's part of the thing. And, and so I've been extremely fortunate. I know plenty of speechwriters who disagree with their boss on fundamental issues. And I've just told them, make your case as forcefully as you can. And that's the best you can do. Can we go to the yeah, hand in the white shirt? Just wait for the mic to get to you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you again. What a fascinating uh, talk. Um, my question is uh, where basically you see the strategy for creating a sanctuary of reflection for speeches again. You know, we live in a world that is where the attention span is, is so reduced. Um, it's a, a sensory hyperinflation. Uh, media, you know, have have really, you know, overwhelm um, the civilian. So, but speeches have nuance. Speeches have, you know, um, a very different format that requires reflection. So, what what technology or what strategy do you think is the best to create reflection again? You are wonderful. <laughs> Bless you. Um, I mean. I well, I, I complain about that all the time. Uh, like, Twitter is one of the worst things that's ever, that's ever happened to, you know, consuming a speech. It just, just I, it used to drive me nuts if I didn't go to a speech and if I was sitting at my computer watching it, you know, I'd have, I'd have Twitter on and reporters would just be picking out single lines or even worse, complaining like, you know, Obama hasn't said anything about guns yet. And I'm screaming at my computer, I'm like, it's, just wait three more paragraphs. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Um, We're doing that right now, tweeting out what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. But I, I don't know how you, you know, put technology back in a box or unwind the fact that we have 500 channels and you know, we, can, we can create our own cocoons of information where we, don't, we can go through an entire day without seeing a dissenting viewpoint. You know? um, I don't know how to turn all those things off. Uh, you know, uh, but, but, but uh, good political speeches aren't going anywhere. I mean, they've been around since Aristotle and Plato. Um, the, the question is, how do you get people to consume them? And that's to, you know, a mix of s say something interesting. Um, uh, tell people a truth that they already know, but, but, you know, most politicians are too cowardly to say. Um, you know, that's kind of what authenticity is, too, is telling people what we already know, you know, but, but nobody ever says it because they're afraid to make a gaffe or to stir up controversy. I mean, we always found that, you know, you can push the envelope farther than you think, uh, and you're often rewarded for it. Um, but, you know, how do you make everybody read again? I don't know. I don't know. But bless you for trying. <laughs> you know? one, one tactic we used um, with our digital media operation in the White House, you know, we didn't just like tweet out lines from speeches, but, um, you know, we would annotate speeches and include graphs and charts with them and, you know, work with um, other outlets to really kind of push them around. Like if we were going to do, um, you know, a speech on data and privacy, we'd, ha we'd get Wired Magazine, which is a big tech magazine in the States, to run something on it or do a sit-down interview with the president. Um, you know, we'd work with Good Heat Housekeeping Magazine, which is read by millions of women if we were pushing, you know, some issue that we thought might be relevant to um, working moms, housewives, whatnot. So we, we would try to get things out to people that don't necessarily consume politics, but consume these other, we did a you know, climate change thing with popular mechanics and popular science. And you know, that doesn't fully solve the problem, but at least you can reach some eyeballs that, that are usually pointed somewhere else. I think we've got time for one more question. Could we go to the, yeah, the hand in the middle there. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, an anecdote that I've found myself kind of coming back to um, from an Obama speech uh, in the current political moment. That's from his, uh, his victory speech in Chicago in 2008. It's the, the Ann Nixon Cooper story yeah. about the 106-year-old woman. I thought, I just, I'd like to ask you like, kind of how that story came to the attention of the speech writing team and just like how you kind of thought like how that got worked into the speech and that process and everything. That was, John Faber actually told that story when he was here at Oxford Union a few years ago. Um, in, in his speech, she was, I can still remember from the speech, Ann Nix Cooper was 106 years old. It was, I think it was our team down in, I want to say she was from Atlanta. Uh, and it was our team down there. Somebody just told us, you know, because you have 
uh, kind of an operation in every polling place that, that phones the numbers into the boiler room in each state so that we can update our projections and, and know what's going on. And I think one of them said this, this woman's just been waiting in line for hours. And they started talking to her. And they gathered up all this information and, and got it up to us. I mean, John would know more specifically. Um, but he kind of crafted this great story around her. Like, all the, think of all the things this woman has seen in her life, right? Kind of the explicit thing to say would be like, the, it's amazing that this 106-year-old black woman finally saw a black president. But it was more, think of all the incredible things she's seen in her life, right? You know, America taking its place on the world stage, you know, uh, world wars and, and, you know, civil rights movements and women's rights movements and, you know, a, a man touched down on the moon, a wall came down in Berlin, and, and in this election, you know, an old woman touched her finger to a screen and cast her vote. Uh, so the, you know, the way John tells it is, you know, he had to get under his desk and call her because we were all celebrating after they'd call it. And, and he said, hey, I just want your permission. We're going to tell your story uh, in the speech tonight. And she, she goes, will it be on television? <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, he goes, yeah. And she's like, what channel? And he goes, all the channels. Uh, <laughs> I, hate, I hate to blatantly steal a story from John, but uh, go, go watch his YouTube when he spoke here. Uh, and he tells it, tells it really, really well. Because I stole John's story, should I answer one more question? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Go for it. <laughs> Uh, can we go to the hand right at the back on the left hand side? Yeah. Um, not sure if this is the best question to end on. It's not, um, maybe as hopeful about politics uh, I <laughs> as some of the others have been tonight. But um, I kind of wanted to relate it to what you were talking about earlier with. Rudy Giuliani's characterization of President Obama. And also something that you said earlier today at the Democrats Abroad conversation, um, you talked about how when you hired uh, more female speechwriters, that kind of changed the way that the president <laughs> was talking about women's issues. And I was wondering if you found it, you found it difficult over the years writing for a black man. It's a great question. Um, and I've gotten it before. In, in a, the answer is yes, I, I did, because, I mean, speech writing is, is ultimately about um, a couple things, but one of the most important ones is empathy. You know, being able to understand your audience, you know, step in their skin and walk around for a little while in their shoes. Um, and empathy only extends so far, you know, nobody's lived everybody else's life. So, you know, the most important answer to that question is our chief speech writer was always President Obama. Um, and I'd always talk to him before any thorny speech. But, you have to get in every person's uh, brain, you know, who, to who you're talking. I'd, I've never served in war, so whenever I was writing a speech uh, for a veteran's audience or a service member's audience or a service member's families, I had three buddies who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. I'd call them up and say, tell me about it. Um, if I was writing a speech to an LGBT audience, I'd talk to some of my gay friends and say, tell me what this is like. You know, what, what, what does it feel like, you know, when to be, I don't know, marginalized or not able to get married? Um, you know, and during the economic crisis, I, I had a family member who got laid off along with two thirds of her company and I talked to her and saw what it did to her sense of self-worth and anger and tried to channel that into speeches too. So empathy is critical and, and there is no one single person who can channel everybody's experience. Um, but we made, I tried to make the team more diverse by, you know, in the second term, we were, we were the first White House speechwriting team in history to uh, be half women. Um, and I found that critically important. I think, though I can't confirm, that we were the only one to have, you know, even two women. Um, we had four. Um, and that wasn't tokenism. I mean, it's critical to, you know, and it's not just because half the country is female. It's because, you know, half people who are listening to your speech are female and you need to be able to speak to them as well. Um, so I'm not a black man, but Barack Obama is not a woman. And it just helped to have more voices like that on the team who, could, who can speak to, you know, different swaths of the country. I think it's vital in, you know, obviously any industry, right? We should have more female CEOs and certainly more female members of Congress. Uh, and a female president would be pretty great. Um, but until we get there, you know, I think small steps ultimately help. Thank you very much, Cody. Thank you for coming and sharing your thoughts and experiences. And everyone, thank you.